Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. With the uh, block leader being in the news, I thought that I would take the cue from the poll that I ran where people were asking me to explain the nature or the, or the origins of the Bloc Québécois. So here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the opportunity to do that right now. I'm warning you, you got to go back in time quite a ways to understand exactly the nature of the problem and the origin of the Bloc Québécois. I'm sure most of you have heard of Christopher Columbus. He was a fellow that sailed for Spain and discovered, like he was sailing under a Spanish flag when he discovered the, the New World. What you might not be aware is that he landed in what's today like Cuba or one of the Dominican, like he landed in what we would call the Caribbean. And then he goes back and everybody gets excited and of course word spreads. So now other governments are sending people out over ships and in Canada... We were discovered by a guy sailing under the British flag, Cabot, what we call Cabot, in his, with this reference to him in Cape Breton when we have what's, what's known as the Cabot Trail. And he discovered Newfoundland, and then he went back, and he came again, but there was a, a problem on his way back. So that was 1497. So Columbus was in 1492, and then Cabot was in 1497. So now we come forward to 1530s, and there is a man sailing under a French flag who sails down the St. Lawrence and discovers what today we know as Quebec or the St. Lawrence River. And his uh, name was Cartier. He made a couple of trips, and he, on the second time, I believe, he sailed as far as uh, what's today known as the island of Montreal and what was called Hochelaga at the time. Now, you could be saying to yourself, what in the world does this have to do with the Bloc Québécois that was founded in, you know, 1991? I'm going to tell you that because of that landing, because the French flag was the guy, there was a lot of um, land that was claimed by France, an enormous amount, to be completely candid with you. Here's a, an, an indication of the second trip that he made from uh, Jacques Cartier from 1535 to 1536. And that's important because under at the time, once he did that, they started landing people in Newfoundland. They were landing people all, all up and down. The, they made a settlement in the St. Lawrence River. They made a settlement 1536. And we talk about Plymouth Rock being 1620. So you can see that there's a lot of, there's a, there's a two, two, three generation gap between when was one started to be settled and when the other one started to be settled. So much so that if you ask a, um, okay, here we can see a map, right? Of what they called new France in 1745. Now you can see that the, uh, Lewisburg where the word Lewisburg is, you can see that Newfoundland and Nova Scotia are both in red. That was because of uh, what happened in 1713, and we still talk about that, the Treaty of Utrecht, which was settled. These were lands were being settled because wars were being fought in Europe. However, in 1745, the map sort of looked like this, and you can see basically from New Brunswick all the way down to what is today New Orleans was all French. Now, there may be some discrepancy in, in the part around Hudson Bay where we would call it um, Rupert's Land who was a prince in, in England. However, if you want to look at what the, the just to give you an idea of how they think about it in the French mentality you'll note that this map is all in French and you'll further note that they have themselves all the way almost to British Columbia they have big sections of what is today New Mexico. They have Newfoundland. They have Nova Scotia. They have all of that. And they're claiming this is what France looked like right up to 1803, which, <laughs> which is just not the situation. But that's the, that's the nature of understanding the separatist movement. In their mind, the land is all French, right? They don't care about <laughs> the First Nations. That's a, <laughs> that's a different argument altogether. Okay, so we see, you can understand, 
that New France was a big section of the continent. And really what's important to understand is two things that nobody talks about. One, we, t- we, say a comment, we say a sentence, we say, oh, all roads lead to Rome. However, most of them pass through France. And France has a lot of culture. It has a lot of, uh, it had a lot of supplies. England, on the other hand, doesn't have that much stuff. So when they came over here, they landed in the Hudson Bay. Unfortunately, the Hudson Bay in those days especially would, could freeze for two years. So they would get lots of supplies, but they wouldn't be able to get the, the product out. That the, land, the ships would be frozen or not able to sail out. And everybody was moving by canoe, right? Now the St. Lawrence River, which is a heavily trafficked river, people don't understand that, became a, a very significant nugget in getting the material out of North America back to Europe where they could make a lot of money and because they could supply. The French didn't have, the French in France had no interest when the, for example, when the, um, the uh, governor of Quebec wrote to France asking for assistance in the uh, Seven Years' War. He said that the British were putting a lot of pressure on him. The French wrote back, we don't worry about what's happening in the stables while the house is on fire because they were losing a lot over in Europe as well. So what it's important to understand, and because we're here at this segment, when Montreal fell to the, to the English... When what's the island of Hochelaga, what today we call Montreal, fell to the English. There were two clauses in the surrender that they wanted kept. One was they wanted to defend their, they wanted to be able, the right to speak French. Now, in and of itself, on the face of it, not a big deal. They, many people spoke French in France because, like I said, it had, all roads passed through France. In those days, especially, France was a very big part of the, of the planet, and England was the poor cousin off to the side. However, they held on to Montreal and they signed the peace treaty. And they, the other thing that was, that's relevant is they um, said, we want to be maintain our religion. Now the English were fighting under the uh, church of England, which is a Protestant, what we call today an Anglican and the French were Catholic. And that's a significant thing, Right. Because rem- the, the reason for the war was to get control of the St. Lawrence River. So now we would bring all, in those days, you, you, you had to stop your boat in what is approximately uh, Kingston. You would take all the supplies, you would put it by canoe, you would portage, you would put it into the various creeks and streams, and you would come down the rivers and you would land at Montreal where you could then put it back onto an ocean-going ship. It would sail up the St. Lawrence River, out past Cape Breton, and onwards to Europe, which was significant because the French held Cape Breton and they held Quebec, and you could fire weapons from the province of, like, from the highlands onto the ships as they were sailing by. So they had to take control of it to get free access all the way from Montreal, where they could load it with supplies, all the way to England, where they would get you know, whatever they did with it, they would either put it to the war effort or they would utilize it or they would sell it. I mean, that's what they were doing at the time. So here we see because of their, because of the priest, they began an isolation. The the French began to tell themselves that they weren't going to be part of that because not because they spoke English or spoke French. Nobody cared about that in those days, but because they were a different religion. Everybody cared about that. I mean, people still care about that. So now the English began to cultivate Montreal and began to sail ships out left, right, and center. So that held for quite a while, right? For many, many moons. And, you know, you develop, you start to do different projects and do different things. But the significance becomes stark when we get to the Second World War. So now we have all of this development where the English... Is to, are working and they're doing their jobs and the French are still being insulated by the church, by the Catholic church. So everybody would deal with the priest and the priests would deal with the English world. So World War II comes and Montreal is a significant staging area for product and material coming out of the 
central part of the continent and on its way to Halifax so that it could join a convoy and sail to Europe, right? The merchant marines. And you might be at this time in your mind thinking, what, where have we gone? And I promise you that these dots will be connected. It has to be mentioned because without it, we don't have the progression. All of these ships coming into Montreal with their supplies and all of these ships going out to the ocean with their supplies, there was a lot of jobs. So what was happening is the people were, that were English were getting paid directly and the people that were getting French were getting, the, the priests in the church would take their pay. They would take a big section out and then they would give the rest to the Francophone individual, the, the Quebecois. So now you had two distinct classes. The English speakers had money to spend because there was no um, donation to the church, like that was a mandatory thing. And the French people were still quite poor. Now, I read one article where one of the individuals were complaining that the guys who worked, the English guys all had bicycles and their wives had bicycles. I mean, it was the 40s. What are you going to do? And that was a significant thing. So there, there was, that, that, was a, that was an indication of independence and prosperity that all of the wives had bicycles, you see? So the... This comes into the 60s when we talk about now all of a sudden we've discovered that not only was it happening on the docks, it was happening in the mines. Quebec has a lot of mining resources. The, the church was, in the, was sep, taking a lot of the money from the people, keeping it and giving little bits and little dribbles and little drabs, which resulted in a two-class system. So the Francophone got upset with the church. Now, if you know anything about the Quebecois, Quebec, the province, the Francophones, all of their curse words are tied to the church. There was a significant cultural um, shift, and we call it the Quiet Revolution. This Quiet Revolution was the Francophone population breaking away from the Catholic Church in anger and hostility. There was strikes, there was a lot of um, um, a lot of tension and and friction and th stuff of that nature that all resulted in the francophone Id identity merging emerging stripped of the the catholic church as part of it which is one of the reasons that they're so secular today then this this popularity, this 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 populist movement, turned into a hostile movement in the late '60s. This resulted in kidnappings, bombings. There was a lot of aggression, a lot of violence. Bombs were being placed. An ambassador from Britain was actually, you know, his his life was taken from him, and. We called this, this, this culminated in what in Canada we call the October crisis. The October crisis happened in 1970 and there was, a, you know, a lot of, there's a, there's a great documentary that I may link in the bottom down in the description about the October crisis and it was uh, Trudeau Sr. that was looking after it. There was the army in the streets. They invoked the Emergencies Act, which, of course, is probably one of the biggest reasons that Trudeau Jr. invoked the Emergencies Act. This was being driven by an organization called the FLQ, the, what translates to the Francophone Liberation of Quebec. They were a violent militant group that ultimately was given the right to... They, Canada flew them to, to Cuba, and I would imagine they stayed there for a long time. Like, I don't know what happened. I didn't track them down. For, for this story, they're not that important, except to say that the FLQ was a violent organization that spawned a lot of political groups. And those various political groups came and flowed and ebbed and joined and separated until finally they developed what, what we would call, what today is known as the Parti de Québécois, the PQ. They are a political group that exists only in the province of Quebec, and their mandate is to separate from Canada. They are a political organization that has, has its roots tied back to a militant organization known as the FLQ. 
kind of like Sinn Féin in the IRA type of thing. So now we have this political body, this, this provincial body, and there's a lot of turmoil, a lot of things are going under, uh, going through changes in Quebec. They nationalized the, the, they nationalized a lot of stuff. They took, a, like, they took control of the hydroelectricity, for example. They nationalized many of the different things, and they call it nationalized, but they basically took the control of it in the province. And they wanted to separate from Canada. Now, as they were doing this, they began to pass a lot of laws, a, a, a lot of dystopia, you know, a lot of um, laws that were against the English language. Bill 101 was passed because there were, they didn't like Italian school children speaking Italian in Montreal. So the laws are rooted around making everybody speak French. They want to eradicate the English language. And I get that it's pretty harsh and I won't, I won't go cover that too much because in this one, we're talking about the emergence of the bloc, right? The bloc Quebecois, who are a federal group of separatists. We come through the seventies, they passed the legislation against the English language in 77. And then we get to a referendum for the separation of Quebec in the eighties. I, I think it was 1980. And this brought us to that vote was overturned the people decided that they wanted Quebec to maintain to remain part of Canada of course that became a problem for the people in Quebec and they didn't want to give up then in 1982 we brought the constitution home from England and the Quebecers didn't like the constitution they wanted to be called the distinct society this this uh, desire to become a distinct society led to a bunch of the provinces getting together and talking about what we were calling because it was being held in Meech Lake. We were calling it what was known as the Meech Lake Accords. Then governments got changed and the Meech Lake Accords never materialized, which caused a lot of problems in Quebec as well because they were still itching to be labeled a distinct society. They needed to make alterations to the constitution that the other provinces have to sign off on and they didn't get that and then they tried it again with the charlottetown accords and that didn't work either so finally a bunch of quebec qua like quebec born politicians from both the conservative and the liberal party left those respective parties and joined together in the 1990s to create a party that we call today the bloc Quebecois. Now you'll hear that they mentioned it in the twenties and in the thirties, and there was different, you know, it's always sort of been there as a, as an idea. However, that's not the point of this video. This video is to make you understand that in 1990, though they had for 20 years, a provincial party called the Parti de Quebecois, they had a decided that they were going to make a federal group called the Bloc, who at one point in their existence have been the official opposition in Canada, which blows me away, if I'm completely honest with you, that they are given federal uh, permissions and f the right to s talk about how the rest of Canada operates when they their whole desire is to leave Canada is kind of a weird position that I think Canadians as a whole should be talking about. Let's look at the situation that we're in right now. I mean, the Bloc Québécois essentially holding up the parliament on different bills, and they're claiming that they may help or they may not. And, you know, they refuse to, to speak English. They refuse to speak any language. They don't want to treat Canadians and Quebec as one country, but they don't mind taking all of the transfer payments that come out of Alberta and the oil that comes out of the British, uh, excuse me, Newfoundland. They don't have any problem with that. They don't have any problem getting all of the resources that travel through Montreal because it's still a very significant port. Many products that land and leave Canada start and end in Montreal still to this day. They don't have any problem with that either. But if you put up an English sign in your business that may be significantly or even the same size as a French sign in your business, they will literally try to take every penny that you have. They will try to take your house. They will absolutely chase after you 
Now, if you put up that same sign and you put it in, you know, letters from China or Korea or something like that, they don't care. It's only the English that they go after. And they go after them in, in the medical systems. They go after them in the government. They refuse flat out. I had, uh, when I was there, I had to call the government one time. It took them three days to find somebody who spoke broken English from Quebec City to call me back. It's really quite sad when you think about the amount of money that it costs them to fight this losing battle. I mean, the amount of music that they, that they listen to, all of the movies that they watch, every time you try to bring that into the province, they have, the companies are forced to rewrap it in a French-only jacket, which costs money, which then, of course, increases the cost, which then, of course, gets Quebecers to buy their stuff from other places. It's really weird. They spend like $300 million a year on a, a secret police force, the only secret police force in Canada that I'm aware of, and what these policemen do is they run around all day long and they find examples of people speaking English who shouldn't be speaking English. They recently passed legislation in Quebec that talks about how you can't buy an English version of Windows. I mean, it's, it's, it's strange. It's the, the level of hatred, the level that they, they, they are rooted in this, this hatred in the idea that the country that they live in was originally French. However, nobody cared about the French. Everybody cared about the St. Lawrence River. That's all that people cared about. The, the, the Plains of Abraham happened because the Scottish guardsmen were able to speak French so convincingly to the centuries at the time that they fooled them into believing they were French. Uh, they were part of the same team. The, Europe has been speaking French for a long time. All of the 40% of the English language is French. But the Quebecois don't understand any of that. They don't care to know any of it. They don't want to hear it. In their mind, the country, the continent was taken from them through an act of war, and they want it back, and they want to be separate. But they don't think their way through that. And, of course, the politicians, like the Parti and the, and the COC, C-A-Q, they, they fan the flames of this stuff, just like you see Justin Trudeau do, right? In an effort to separate and divide so that everybody will be chasing their tails. I mean, every time in Quebec, when they get into it, when they cause a scandal, they just bring out somebody from the back benches who starts screaming about, about separation in the news. And then the whole cycle starts all over again and the scandal is forgotten. And as everybody gets all fired up and frothing at the mouth over separation. So that's the root and the cause of the Bloc Québécois. They want to separate from Canada. They get a federal mandate to do it. I don't know why we permit them to come into the House of Commons at all, but I suppose that that's outside of my uh, understanding of constitutional law. I, I bet I could look it up. Either way, they are a federal party that only runs in one province. They don't have seats anywhere else. They refuse to speak English as they don't like to speak English at all. That's why when they stand up in the House of Commons, they have to be translated, which of course is uh, foolish because they speak a lot of French in, in Manitoba and nobody seems to get upset about that. I don't have much, I, I don't think that the uh, attacking somebody for the language that they speak is any way, any virtue or any redeeming quality at all. And I don't believe for one second that they understand the ramifications and every time they try to separate, they, had an, they held another referendum, I believe, in 1995, and the island of Montreal turned the tide again, because in those days, the island of Montreal was very strongly English. Now they've passed laws against people working in English, and they, they are just doing their best to try and breed them out, as the expression goes. But the people in Montreal still don't want to be separate from Canada, and the, I doubt very much that the strategic importance of the island of Montreal and the strategic importance of the St. Lawrence River would be ignored or forgotten by the Canadian government. And if it was, that would just be foolish. But it absolutely will not be ignored by the United States of America, who used the St. Lawrence River to pull out a lot of stuff from a little city, you know, like Detroit, and where we have strategic um, locking of the Great Lakes. Okay, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.